Let's pray as we begin. Lord, we thank you for the witnesses of these people that we read about in the first few chapters of, or two chapters of Luke, and as we read about Simeon and Anna and what they say and what they do and who they are, Lord, may that be a challenge to us, we pray, and may all of it point to who you are, ultimately. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Very good. As we start out today, I want to think of the kinds of things that we might expect to see. So what behaviours would be suitable for someone who is faithful to God? Now, it's a very challenging question because uh, there's all kinds of views people have about what kind of things are godly and what aren't. There's always arguments. But what are the kinds of things we would generally agree about today? The things like obviously being generous, um, having time to help others, which is just another way of being generous with your time, being considerate about other people. And one that you hear a lot these days is simply being a nice person. You you feel comfortable about being around someone like that, don't you, if they're a nice person? Now, these are all good things as far as they go, but we do need to keep in mind that anyone, Christians and non-Christians, they, they can be like that, can't they? They can all be nice people. They can all be generous and, and friendly and all that. In fact, many of the nicest and most generous people you could meet are not saved people. So as beneficial as those kinds of people are to a peaceful and harmonious society, they're not godly. So what is something that's a bit more definitive according to God's standards? Well, certainly Faith. But how do you recognize faith, really? One way is by their fruit. That's one thing that Jesus said, certainly. That what kind of trail is the person leaving behind them is one way I like to think of it. You know, what's the effect of their work? Are they a good apple or a bad apple? So, so on the good, good apple side, is it clarity, confidence in God? and love and faithfulness and all those kinds of things, is that what characterizes their work? The things they do and about, go about in their lives? Or on the other side, is it confusion, doubt, discord and disharmony and falling away, both in themselves and in the people they influence? So is it that what they leave in their wake? And I just slipped into a bit of nautical language there. It's probably because I got a skipper's ticket this week. Yes. <laughs> Yes, well, there's a few of us doing that, so it was good. The Lord, I'll sit tomorrow. <laughs> so yeah, another, another good way is by how much they love the Word of God. Since the Bible is the only absolutely reliable source of God's communication with us, if someone shows a love and hunger for it, there is certainly a strong pointer that they're a godly person. It's not absolute proof from outside, because many appear to read and love God's Word, but still manage to twist it or reinterpret it or... Simply not follow it one way or another. But Jesus said this to his disciples in John eight thirty-one to thirty-two. Oh, you don't need to go there. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So we can see from this that the people who are truly following Jesus will be spending time or abiding in his word one way or another. So the question is, how closely does that describe you? And really, if we're honest, we could all raise the bar in some way in that part of our lives. I'm pretty sure we could all say that. We could all agree with that. And so we should, because there's freedom in that. There's great freedom in knowing Jesus better. It's a way you can't even explain sometimes. Um, And when I say... When I say you know, get to know Jesus better, I'm, I'm talking about the real Jesus of Nazareth, not some concept which he can become for many people, or just a product of someone's own imagination that they sort of stick the label Jesus on. Remember Christmas Day, sticking the label on? Like one of the one people sort of characterise Jesus as, um, it's just he's like a simply a, a gentle soul who only ever went around being nice and cuddling children and that kind of thing. I think if you ask the Pharisees of Jesus' day, they might give you a different story. So we need to know the real Jesus that the gospel described for us. Certainly he was uh, 
a loving person, that's for sure. Not, just definitely not get that wrong. But we not want to know the real Jesus the gospel describes, the gospels describe, which is one reason we're getting into Luke for, for this period of time. But the reason I bring this up about recognizing godly people is because in this section of Luke we're going to encounter some people today, as we had read to us already, obviously, and they are clearly faithful people. I wonder how well we can see that picture. It's a bit stylized, but you can see that's meant to be Simeon. So these people, Simeon is one of them, they loved God deeply. And the evidence they gave in their lives for that was that they believed God. So that's the, one of the key things, believing God. They believed that what he told them was true and, that, and their lives reflected it. And in Simeon's case, even his cheerful welcome of his impending death reflected that. So that's why love for God and his word are always a good measure of faith because it's always been that way right through history. For instance, Abraham believed God, didn't he? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And for us today, it's the same. If we believe him, most importantly by believing in his son Jesus, who, just point out, was also known as the word. That's part of what I mean if you've got the sheet in front of you there with the word. It also refers to Jesus. Um, so if we believe in his son Jesus, we have righteousness as well. But it wasn't Simeon and Anna who we're talking about. They're also, not, not just Simeon and Anna anyway, they're also Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph. They appear today. But how can we know that they were faithful lovers of God? One way was their commitment to following the law of God. Now, keep in mind, of course, this is before the cross. So still Old Testament era when the law was still binding. But the principle, again, is true in all ages. If you love God, you'll naturally want to please him at least more and more. And you would be, you'll be very careful to try and do so. You'll make it, make it a real serious business to try and please, please God. So you could say it's your heart attitude that matters. Because we all fall down in the, in the actual living of that. But it's what's in here that matters. So in Mary and Joseph's day, that meant a faithful person would certainly carry out the requirements of the law of Moses because that's what the existing paradigm was. So that's what we find Jesus' parents doing here in, in 2 verse 22 where we start our passage today because it was of critical importance for all of us that Jesus was ceremonially perfect. I don't know if you ever thought of it that way but he had to obey the whole law. And because he himself did it, um, that means we didn't have to. And as he said, he did not come to abolish the law but fulfill it. That means a lot of, uh, there's a lot of aspects to that idea of him fulfilling the law. And because he fulfilled the law perfectly by God's standard, like I said, we no longer have that hanging over us as a requirement. It's, it's done with. So we have a lot to be thankful to Jesus for. I'm sure if you've Every time we have the Lord's table, we think about another thing. And also, there's, there's Mary and Joseph who were faithful to obey God with their firstborn son as well. So, so let's have a look at that, verse 22. Verse 22, And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now just to explain there, the law, and specifically the, the part they're referring to here is Leviticus 12, 1 to 4. Uh, that required that a woman who had given birth to a baby boy had to come and be made ceremonially, ceremonially clean 40 days later. So 40 days is one of those symbolic periods. Uh, interestingly, for a baby girl, it was double that. So you'd have to wait 80 days. And I haven't got into why that is yet. I'll have to find that out one day, but I don't know. Maybe girls are more important, I don't know. <laughs> so this period of 40 days had passed. And then Mary and Joseph did as they were instructed. Verse 23, As it is written, In the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb, in other words the firstborn, shall be called holy to the Lord. So that's a quote from Exodus 13 verse 2. So Luke's proving that this is what's written. 
verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, this stuff about the birds, that's, that's now the third reference to the Torah. That's the, the Torah is the first five books of, of the Bible, the Old Testament, of the, of the Old Testament first, and then obviously we have the New Testament as well. But it's the third reference to the Torah in our little three verses we've had so far. So we can see that Luke is making very clear that this human being, Jesus, is ticking all the boxes according to the laws applicable to the Jewish people. He's God, for sure. But remember, Luke's focus is to present Jesus as the perfect man. And so I think this is part of his reason for doing this, that he's the perfect man. He ticks all these boxes. And incidentally, the law actually stated that normally a family would not offer two birds, but that offer a lamb and a bird for their firstborn son. But there was an alternative for those who couldn't afford the lamb, because the lamb could be expensive. And that was just to offer another bird. So instead of the bird and the lamb, you'd have two birds. That was an op op opportunity for those who couldn't afford it. And th this is found in Leviticus 12, verse 8. So I, we just looked at Leviticus 12, verse 1 to 3 before, or 1 to 4, sorry, about the 40-day thing. So this is just after that, so it's sort of connected. But the point is, what we can gather from this is that Mary and Joseph were poor, which matches what we know about Lord Jesus, doesn't it? He... He didn't get born into riches and to fame and a cushy lifestyle. He was born with the animals. Remember the Christmas uh, account? And he was born as a su supposed illegitimate child. I'd use another word, but the kiddies are around, if you know what that word is. Illegitimate child. Then they placed him in a manger, so a feeding trough, not a cot. And he was on, on the run from Herod, even as a baby. You read about that in, in Matthew, I think it is. And he couldn't even afford a lamb for his dedication. So from that we can say at least it's nice to know he's not beyond us, is he? Sure, his righteousness is beyond us. And we should be thankful for that even more so. But he's familiar with the hard life, you know, the, the school of hard knocks and all the stuff that so many of today's elite have no idea about. But most of us do. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to be introduced to this old man, Simon. Sorry, Simeon. I knew I was going to say that. Simeon. Because it's just there, you know. At a glance. Simeon is his name. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. All right, so what does Luke tell us about Simeon in this little verse? Firstly, that he was recognizable as a faithful person who loved God. So when Luke says he was righteous, that doesn't mean he was sinless. Or even that no one said anything bad about him. It wasn't just he was popular amongst the people, though he may have been. But in the Bible, in these kind of contexts, it usually means simply that he was justified. He had submitted his life to God and was saved from his sins. Or using the term from last week, he was reconciled. Or looking at it another way, God had accepted him. Because God can only accept what's righteous, can't he? So, so Jesus' righteousness was his righteousness. That's the only way we can reconcile those two things. He had taken God's righteousness on himself. And that's the only way we can be accepted by God. So it's kind of like the robe idea I mentioned last week. And for those who weren't here, that's it's sort of like how Jesus' death and resurrection form a robe, like something you'd put on. And we could submit to it by putting it on and becoming justified before God. But it's our choice to put it on. It's offered to us. So that's righteous. What about devout? Some translations use the word pious or God-fearing. And the Greek word is, is literally taking hold well, if you translate it literally. So it sort of reflects the idea that he's someone who is careful to obey the laws of Moses and do all the right things. So he took hold well of all those things that God had put before him to do. So the two words there, 
righteous and devout, are two words which pretty much cover, one, his status before God. So that's to do with his status. In other words, he was saved, he was redeemed. And number two, his behavior. So that's to do with how he honored God, so whether in his life and in what things he did. So one's status is one's behavior. So as I mentioned last week, it's, it's good to show how concepts from one area can tie into concepts with another area. So, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm just a bit one-track-minded here, but it brought up in my mind the three tenses diagram again. So guess what, you're going to see that again. Um, now, as I mentioned last week, this, that was last week's was a rehash from a few months ago, but again, I just want to show that these things all can fit together. So I do want to point out now the opportunity has arisen. We're going to get these two words, righteous and devout, and show where they fit in this picture. But not just each one, as a combination, as a pair. Okay, So if you're not sure what that means, listen up. So firstly, let's put Simeon on there. Now we were told he's righteous and devout, right? So where would Simeon fit on this? And he would be somewhere up on the, on the green strip there. So he'd be there somewhere. Let's not put him exactly on the line because he's not, I don't know, not that perfect. But, you know, he's, he's growing. And we, we put him up there uh, because he's probably, he's, he's old, so he's probably quite a mature believer, we expect. So let's sort of put him up pretty high. So that's someone who's righteous and devout, okay? Now, what about someone who's righteous but not devout? What does that mean? So I've been trying to get the idea between the, the two things, what they mean here. Where would you put someone who's righteous but not devout? Anyone want to have a guess? Below the tree? Yep. 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 Yeah. In, inside the line there, yep, but, but not above the tree, yep. I actually stuck them out here, and I have a reason for that. Um... It's what I'd call, because out to the right side there, it's what I sort of call the, the roadside ditch kind of thing if you're off in the ditch. Um, and out near the edge, you could think of sort of as like a gutter. Now, it sounds bad, but just it's all right. It's just people who, who they're saved, but they're just not fruitful and not representing Christ very well at all. So that's what I argue probably not on the green strip, because the green strip is just various degrees of growth, but you're not demonstrating a lot of fruit. Okay, so so if that's you right now, if you're like you're not on that green strip and you're out perhaps in the ditch there, what can you do? Well, that's where Hebrews six can point us in the right direction. This is sort of all came from Hebrews six, as you, those who are here then know about that. And uh, so you can look up Hebrews six if you like, or you can go on again. I'll point out YouTube again this week. The our our. Um, channel there you can look up Collie Church of Christ and message 10 on the salvation series talks about this explains it and that's where I try and explain the idea I don't know how well I did but anyway people seem to some people got it the key thing though is, is about moving out of the gutter or the ditch is to realize what's at stake you need to get a reality check I think so you've got to become familiar again with how sinful we really are without God but all the same, just how much Jesus loves us and how much he gave to save you and me. And then and we can learn then to trust him more fully and get back on the track towards where we should be going. So it's really about collapsing in a heap before him in surrender of yourself and your own efforts. And if you're holding out, then do that now before the days get even harder to do it. Okay, so on this picture, what about someone who is neither righteous nor devout? Where would you put them? Sorry? Lost? Yeah, so they're on the, the bottom, sort of, I'll use my pointer here. That's pointing down there, out here somewhere, <laughs> off the screen. Well, I mean, they could be anywhere in that area, of course, but they're certainly not repentant. They have no relationship with Jesus, so they're lost and they're heading away from God. They need to repent and accept Jesus' death for them and become saved. So is that you this morning? 
I hope not, but if so, we, I'd love to talk. Please talk with one of us. And the last combination <coughs> is devout but not righteous. And I'll just give you that one. That's, I'm putting that about there. They're at the edge, but they aren't in Christ. Okay, so devout but not righteous. So there's a whole bunch of people in every era who are like that. And I think you could put the Pharisees in that category. Most of the average Pharisee anyway. Very often they're people who try so hard to get to God by their own strength. They're being devout, but by their own means. So you can see there, the picture there, he's this particular symbol. You're trying to get in, but there's, there's only one way in, isn't there? There's only one way. There's only one gate. There's no other door, no other way. There's only there's Jesus Christ. There. That's the only way in. Now, in many ways, these people are harder to save than the outright denier because the outright denier is the person who's not righteous nor devout because they think they're doing the right thing. But in the end, they're still lost. That's, that's the horrible truth. So I hope that helps shed some light on some things and give us a bit more context to what we are looking at today. And uh, so, yeah, I hope you can take that with you. But we look, go back to Simeon now and what verse 25 tells us about him. So we see he was also a student of Bible prophecy. How do we know that? Well, he knew the scriptures, from the scriptures, that the destiny for his people Israel was that the Messiah would come and be the comforter for them, to console them and after all the strife that experienced. And little did he know how much more was and is to come for them, but still he was expectant. He was waiting for God to act as promised because he knew the word of God. And we're also told the Holy Spirit was upon him. So this is a hint that what follows in the prayer, or some people call it the song that he's about to give, is especially enlightening for us as uh, God's Spirit will be speaking through him. But before we get there, Luke has some more to tell us. So let's look at verse 26 next. And it had been revealed to him, that's Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now that would give you some confidence in living, wouldn't it? So, uh, is the Messiah here? No? Beauty, I can do whatever I want, but I'm not going to die today. Might go start bungee jumping or something, I don't know. But no, I'm sure he wasn't blasé about it, and that's it's a very solemn privilege to have that revealed to him, I'm sure. And I'm sure God only did it because he knew he wouldn't abuse that privilege. So that's a, that's a bit of a lesson there about the people God gives stuff to, you know. And so the day had arrived. So verse 27. And he came to oh, in the Spirit into the temple. Uh, notice Luke emphasizes that he's still under the specific control of the Holy Spirit here. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Okay, so... Of course, we don't know how long ago Simeon had received this word from God, but I assume it had been many years. But now the waiting was over. His expectation had finally been fulfilled. He was now free to go home. He had peace. Peace had arrived. As he says there, peace can depart in peace. Because for all of us, there is to, uh, there is, to some degree a lack of peace when there is some disagreement between what the current situation that we're in and what we know God has promised. Do you feel that sometimes? God's promised so many good things, but we're, life is hard. And we certainly see it in the world around us. It's getting more chaotic, more dangerous, more sinful. But we read in the Bible that God will one day fix everything and he'll be the eternal ruler of the universe. He's the eternal ruler, but he's going to be acknowledged by everyone. And if we love him, then, like Simeon, and as we'll come to see also like Anna, we should long for the day that happens. That's a promise he's made. We should long for it. But in the meantime, we live without the peace that comes from the fulfillment of God's promises. So when you experience that kind of lack of peace, don't despair. 
have hope because the fulfillment is still coming. Hopefully soon. But of course, I need to add that this lack of peace is more a, a tension between your own heart and that which is outside you. If you have Jesus, the Prince of Peace, living in your heart, his life is your life, you can be sure that your eternal self, your spirit, is at peace, even when it doesn't feel like it. Okay, So trust God's word on that, that if you're saved, you have peace in here. So Simeon experienced something of that coming of peace as he holds the Prince of Peace in his, in his arms. Pretty amazing thing to do, isn't it? And then he talks more about material faculties, so like his eyes, so he speaks in verse 30, For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Now you've heard me mention many times now the significance of Jesus' name. I think it's about probably a few times in the last few weeks. So Simeon is literally looking at the Lord's salvation in more ways than one. Because Jesus, Yeshua, means the Lord is salvation. And something else you should know about the end of Simeon's prayer here is that there's a, a, the language of feasting kind of in, in verse 31 there, especially verse 31, when he talks about preparing in the presence of all peoples. It's sort of like there, there are hungry people from all the nations sitting down at the table um, as the host, who would be God, he brings out a fantastic banquet for them to eat together. So this is consistent with other illustrations in Scripture. And Psalm 23 is one. You know, prepare a place in the face of his enemies. And obviously the parable of the banquet in Luke 14 is another one. And I like that kind of illustration because I love food. Now you might not notice looking at I just got a high metabolism I think, but it's, it's, it's such a great blessing that God gives us to be able to enjoy it and the taste and the smells and, and all those things and in fact, it's all the senses, isn't it? There's five senses coffee called that because every sense, if you go through it, 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 every sense enjoys it. So same with food. So it does resonate with us, doesn't it? All that mealtime imagery. And so in this context, that's what Simeon seems to have in mind, that we can feast together on this lavish provision of salvation that God is offering us. But then Simeon also draws from what seems to be passages like 49 verse 6, sorry, Isaiah 49 verse 6, uh, because that says this, He, that's God, says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, this is referring to Jesus here, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So the God is saying that just saving Israel would be too narrow a plan. He wants people from all over the world. He made the whole planet and all the people on the planet. So his heart is for the whole lot to be back as he originally planned it. That's his final plan. And if you look at the end of the book, that's what it says. So he uses the nation of Israel as the catalyst and ultimately as the source of the Messiah. So Jesus was Jewish to accomplish this greater work of saving the world over, the whole world. So that's glory for Israel, since they're a chosen, they're chosen vessel for God to work through, but glory will reach the whole world as well. So these are some big thoughts. This is like the whole of history thoughts here, and this is the thoughts that Simeon's having. He knows the significance of this child, and he trusts God that he's going to do as he promised with this child. And it's these big amazing things that make Mary and Joseph take notice too because verse 33 says they marveled at what was said about him. So I'd say the true magnitude of what God was doing was still sinking in for them, for Mary and Joseph. And each new person who spoke gave them another burst of awareness and we'll go through a bit of the list of those people at the end. But Simeon's not finished yet. Verse 34 and 35. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul also, so that, through, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now, some of you may um, have come to mind there, Hebrews 4, verse 12. So we'll just read that as well. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living and active. So remember Jesus, like I said, called the word. That's one of his titles. 
The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So really what Simeon is saying here carries the idea of, of polarization, which is something you may not have thought of, but it's, it's sort of sorting out the sheep from the goats, to use a biblical analogy. So that kind of thing. When, when Jesus is present, you get all kinds of reactions, don't you? Some fall and some rise. And just for a comment, the word there for, for rise is the same word that elsewhere is translated resurrection. It's anastasis. So it may be eternal things on Simeon's mind here. Yeah, some go to destruction, but some go to eternal life. But also, Jesus is opposed by some. He provokes strong reactions and is offensive to many. Just look out there today. The, the name of Jesus is, is offensive to many. And this sword, this dividing sword, will even hurt his mother Mary, and that is generally explained to, as her pain at the crucifixion, seeing her son be crucified. But generally speaking, Jesus' life and witness will reveal the true intentions of people's hearts. That's why it's important for us as we witness to present Jesus, not nothing else. It's Jesus. He's the divider. Because there will be no hiding, no grey areas when we all have to stand before Jesus one day and give account of our lives to him. And if you really think about that, that's a scary prospect for all of us. But that's a good fear, really, it is, because it's a holy fear that we should have of our Creator. So what will we say when we're there before him and have to give our account? We can think about what to say, but the thing to realize is that the issue is settled by the time this happens. Because none of us will be able to successfully defend ourselves on that day, on our own terms. The outcome of that meeting will have been settled during our time on earth. So this is the time of our salvation. So once you're before Jesus, it's too late. In person. If you haven't made peace by then, you'll end up on the wrong side of eternity and that's not a nice place to be. Eternal fire is, is only a bit of it. It's, it's the agony of knowing you could have and should have done something, but now there's no hope. That's the deepest pain. So please make sure you've made peace today. But that's where Simeon leaves the biblical account, as in we don't hear from him again, from him or about him again. But I'm sure he'll be someone interesting to talk to in heaven, as would the next person Luke introduces us to, I'm sure. And we're about to meet her. Her name's Anna. Here's what Luke says about her in verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. In other words, she was married to him for seven years, and then he died. And then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. So yeah, summarizing, she's a very old widow who was also righteous and devout as well, I'm sure. So much so, so she had dedicated her life to worshipping God and praying at the temple all the time. I'm not sure whether she didn't depart meant she never ever left or whether just the fact that she had her quarters there, but I'm sure she occasionally walked out. But it does say she was characterized by a couple of things. One was fasting. Now, would you say that's something that characterizes you, fasting? Now, I know these days there's all different kinds of fasting we talk about, but the fasting here they're talking about is obviously of food and probably drink. And I haven't heard about many people today who are known for fasting, but it is something we're expected to do. So Jesus in, in Matthew 6.16 said, When you fast, not if you fast. Now, I don't have time today to go into a whole thing about fasting, but it's something that does often characterize faithful people right through biblical history. And if nothing else, it's a lesson in self-control. I'm just trying to think about what actually the benefits are. And it does help self-control and in obedience. And if that's not enough, there are actually some very good health benefits as well. And if you've a lot of people today are taking on that five days, two-day thing, and that that's, helps self-control as well, I suppose. So if that's something God's been nudging you about, I recommend you go and do a bit of research and get informed. 
Don't just jump into a great big fast and expect to, to do well because it actually can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. But start small and I, I suggest you'll see your relationship with God deepen and widen just like Anna's. And of course she prayed a lot as well, that's the other thing. So something that is pretty obvious to add to the list of things that those who love God do is to pray, obviously. And prayer is you know, simply speaking to God, isn't it? That's how you define it. So as I've mentioned before, I consider reading the Bible a form of prayer if you're really focusing on it because God is communicating with you, isn't he, as you're reading the Bible. So it should be the part of the ongoing conversation with God where you're listening. You know? You're listening to God speak to you. So that uh, is a little bit about Anna. So Luke goes on now. Verse 38. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So in her function as a prophetess, people would have paid close attention to what Anna said. And Luke tells us here that she was list, listened to particularly, uh, certainly this time at least, by those who are waiting for the redemption of, of Jerusalem. So here we see more people alert to prophecy. They knew God's word that he had promised a future for his land, specifically for the city of Jerusalem. So those prophecies, prophecies are all through certainly Isaiah and well, all, the, all the major and minor prophets really, and in several of the Psalms as well, and beyond. So these people believed God and were expectant. That's the key thing. They were expectant, waiting for God to act. And so when Anna turned up and saw this baby Jesus, she knew he was the key to God's plan. So she told people about him. It's a natural reaction. So she might have said something like, you know all that stuff God said about the future? All of it comes to you because of this little baby. He's the central person in God's plan to bring about what he's promised. So that, was, we assume Anna's testimony would have been something like that. And then she also disappears from the story of the Bible as well. So just little cameos from these two guys today. But the fruit of her work is very good. The trail she leaves behind her is one of clarity, confidence, love and faithfulness. Remember those things we mentioned before. And as we start to wrap up now, I just want to point out that these promises that Anna and the people who listened to her were thinking of, we're part of what verse 39 is referring to. So let's just look at verse 39. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. It's talking about Mary and Joseph and Jesus there. So they started their lives with the new baby back in their hometown from this time on. It's, it seems to be the case anyway. It's very tricky actually trying to work out a chronology exactly what happened at, around the time of Jesus' birth. And no one's really settled on a good chronology, but this seems to be what happened. But the point I want to draw out here is related to Luke, again, noting that they did everything according to the law of the Lord. Because something that many people overlook, I think, is that everything that is in the law of Moses is prophetic in a sense. That is, in, in some way, every part either points to Jesus or is fulfilled by him. So many of those things we haven't figured out quite yet, perhaps, but uh, and that's probably because they're it's either still to happen or or um, so when, when when they happen, they'll become obvious. That's what I'm trying to say. So when they do happen, but the most obvious one that has been fulfilled is the, the Passover you know, with the sacrificing of the lamb. That was always designed to point the Jews to the fact that their saviour would be like a lamb, a sacrifice for them. That's, that's what it was meant to point to as a, as a prophecy, really. So as I mentioned before, Luke makes a big thing out of the fact that Jesus fulfilled everything the law said. It's like a big flashing sign, if you like, with an arrow, especially for the Jewish people. This guy's who you've been waiting for. So all these things are meant to be pointing to him. If you're not paying attention, you'll miss it. But unfortunately, most of them still missed it. So each of us had better make sure we're not in the same boat. Because if they had no excuses to miss Jesus, we have even less, don't we? Think about the people God has been speaking through, even just the first few chapters of Luke here. 
So, of course, there's Mary and Joseph, Jesus' parents, and their, their testimony was faithful. But beyond them, we have a, a, bunch, a bunch of old people, firstly, proving you're never too old for God to use. Because there was Zechariah, remember, the old priest in the temple. And there was his wife, the elderly Elizabeth, who nevertheless, even though she was really too old, gave birth to John the Baptist, who himself was someone who even while he was in the womb was celebrating Jesus and gave testimony to Jesus, didn't he? And today we met another old guy, Simeon, as well as the really old Anna, both of whom help us to see who this Jesus really was as well. So there's four old people right there. And in between all of them we had the shepherds, who probably weren't old, but some might have been. But they were rough guys, as we saw on Christmas Day, and if they were, you know, if they were able to be convinced, then anyone can be. And of course there was the angel Gabriel as well, who showed up a few times, and may well have been the angel who spoke to the shepherds, possibly. And then the other is the hosts of heaven who celebrated the birth of Jesus in the sky. Well, I guess it didn't say it was in the sky, does it? They were there. And they celebrated the birth of Jesus to the shepherds while they were still in the fields. So I count there seven people or groups outside Mary and Joseph who confirm for us the identity and significance of this child. So remember, so seven. Zechariah, Elizabeth, John the Baptist, Simeon, Anna, Gabriel and the hosts of heaven, if you count them as one. So I think God is telling us this is important. So let's make sure we pay attention then, hey, <laughs> to the old people. Pay attention to the old people, as long as they're pointing to Jesus. Yeah? So in a few weeks, when I'm back, it will um, continue through Luke. Hopefully, God really confirms in our hearts that Jesus is God in flesh and the only way of salvation for us all. And just as they all were expectant and then they celebrated his first arrival, we need to be expectant to celebrate his second arrival. As Revelation 22.20 says, Amen, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha.